I'm almost impressed Marvel is still even going at this point. Phase 4 has been the entertainment world's equivalent to the Ohio train derailment, and just like our current government, it's gone pretty much ignored. Only one film, No Way Home, was both decent and profitable, with everything else adding to the record losses Disney and Marvel continue to endure. And so an arbitrary line was drawn in the sand to immediately separate this film and those to come from the cinematic travesty that has been the last few years. Enter the Marvel Cinematic Universe's Phase 5, and it comes out swinging like a blindfolded child at a pinata party. Before we jump into this, please subscribe to help build my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania picks up shortly after The Blip, which is the single most ignored thing in this franchise next to the hopes of a Hulk sequel. Scott Lang has been living his life. He's celebrated, a successful writer, and his romance with Hope is going swell. That is, until he gets a call from a San Francisco jail informing him that his his daughter Cassie is under arrest. As it turns out, Cassie has decided to do her part and to help the world by becoming one of the worst and most vile creatures on the planet. She has become the hipster of the political realm, an activist. <laughs> So she's released, and the whole family goes to get dinner together. At the house, Pim has been working on ants that have advanced technologies, Cassie has her own suit, and has managed to build a beacon that can send signals down to the quantum realm. How did she do this, you wonder? Well, you see, she read Hank's journals, so she really likes the quantum realm. What is it with this universe and hyper-intelligent people who can just make things out of nowhere that they should have no comprehension of? We all rolled our eyes a little bit when Tony Stark makes his arc reactor in a cave with a box of scraps, but at this point, it is beyond parody. For example, I like astrophysics, but that doesn't mean I could build a circuit board, let alone the Hubble telescope. Or would you have me believe that she asks someone else to build it for her? Someone else who makes something from nothing, like Riri Williams. You know, the girl whose crowning achievement is a Beetleborg with cornrows. Anyway, Michelle Pfeiffer wigs out because Quantum Realm bad, and unplugs the beacon. Then, taking this as a challenge, the plot says hold my beer, as the beacon is re-energized somehow, and sucks all of them, including the ants, into the Quantum Realm. Down in the Quantum Realm, the group is separated. Scott and Cassie wander around until they're detained by people who have suffered under him for many years. And then they're attacked, most are arrested, and we're introduced to MODOK. I don't know what a MODOK is, but I can tell you that he looks like a Mighty Beans with legs. And if this wasn't odd enough, it is revealed that he's actually the villain from the first Ant-Man. Darren, how the hell are you alive? Your body shrunk one appendage at a time, and your insides should look like Laffy Taffy machines, and you're mostly fine? Well, I guess death from shock doesn't mean anything anymore. What the fuck ever, Scott and Cassie are brought in after the siege for him. Meanwhile, somewhere else, Hank, Hope, and Janet wander around until they meet travelers that Janet apparently knows, and they help point her in the direction of an old friend to help them out. And the entire time they've been wandering, Janet has been ignoring the simple question of who is him. And we are forced to play this fucking pronoun game for over half the film before Janet eventually answers, but we'll get to that later. You see, first, we must endure one of the most wasteful cameos when Janet meets up with her old friend, a restrained, unfunny, and practically on his deathbed, Bill Murray. He's in this film for a literal three minutes, and it is probably the most expensive check Disney ever wrote. I can only imagine how much that check was. In order to recoup the money, Disney might have had to purchase and then burn down a children's hospital to collect the insurance. Anyway, he betrays the group, they steal his ship, which happens to look like a Tempest from StarCraft II, and they get away. During this flight, Catwoman finally spills the beans about Kang. He was imprisoned in the Quantum Realm because he has knowledge of and caused a war at the multi Universal level. Kang is trapped because his energy core for his ship was damaged. Janet was saved by, befriended, and helped Kang until she learned who he was upon finishing the repairs and touching the energy core for his Ashley furniture. How did she receive this information from an inanimate energy source? Not a fucking clue! I was so confused in the theater my eyebrows inverted. So this overload of information gives her the reason to destroy the energy core by smacking it with pin particles that grow it in size. After she escaped, Janet believed she would never have to see or hear from the Quantum Realm again. 
That is, until the writers came along. Meanwhile in prison, Scott makes a deal with Kang for Cassie's life to retrieve the core. When they arrive at the core, Scott goes down to retrieve it in a scene that blatantly rips off the Have We Met episode from Red vs. Blue, complete with a dead Scott and one in a different costume. You know, calling out the Witcher blood origin for ripping off Final Fantasy VI was obscure enough, but I would say this takes the cake for the most obscure thing I've ever seen ripped off. Like, I find it hard to accept that the writers are even this cultured. So anyway, the Wasp shows up because the rest of the group has, and she goes down to save Scott, who gets the core, and then it is given to Kang, who takes it back to his base, and everyone is sad for a moment, thinking that they lost. That is, until they got over themselves, realizing they're all heroes with super suits, and they assault Kang's fortress. Why even waste the time? So up above, you have Scott smashing through the front gates like this is Attack on Titan. Meanwhile, you have Cassie, who goes down to the prison to free the freedom fighters so they can fight to be free after they fight for freedom. And she does just this, until Darren shows up and gives chase. That is, until he's basically decommissioned, and then the perfect example of the terrible quality of the writing, the humor, and green screen compositing that this movie has occurs. Darren, stop! I'm trying to be whatever this is! I don't know what to be. Tell me what to be. I don't know, just don't be a dick. It's too late. Look at me. I'm such a dick. It's never too late to stop being a dick. That is real. Someone got paid to write that. So Darren has a redemption arc, the siege is going well, and then... Hey, hey joins, joins the, the battle. battle. You see, he has a vaporizing beam that he shoots from his palms that, again, and with the heaviest of emphasis, vaporizes anyone it hits. So, my dear people, what do you think happens? A, Kang flies over the battlefield like a god and wipes out entire swaths of the freedom fighters fighting for freedom and forcing Scott and co. to use their combined intellect to defeat a superior foe. Or B, shit tier writing. If you answered B, congratulations. You're not an idiot. If you answered A, well, at least I appreciate your optimism. So, Kang flies down onto the battlefield, kills a bunch of people, and then he's just run the fuck over by an army of ants. Then, up in the control room, the family uses the energy core to return home. And then, Kang pops up for one final battle, in which he nearly beats Scott to death. And then we get an all-too-familiar monologue before Scott destabilizes the energy core, setting it to explode. Then Hope appears and shoots him with her pew-pew wristbands, and Scott punches him into the collapsing energy core, thus killing this Avengers-level threat. I almost don't know where to begin with this. I feel like I've been tasked with the cleanup in the aftermath of a tornado. There are simple things that can be touched on that honestly shouldn't matter much, but in the grand scheme of things do. For example, the bad scene. CGI. It is not a secret that Disney Marvel should be charged under the Geneva Convention for how they treat 3D artists, and it shows. There is not a scene in which Darren doesn't look cartoonishly stupid with a stretched face looking like a PS3 HD remake of Mr. Carrington from Perfect Dark. Or take that clip I showed earlier of Cassie talking with Darren. So, not only did they not composite her correctly, they didn't slow down the footage, so now it looks way too fast, like Godzilla raids again. You know, bad CGI aside, the writing could have gone through a few edits too. Again, that clip is peak Ant-Man 3 dialogue. Kang has some good lines, and Jonathan Majors gives a good performance, but this is Metroid Other M quality writing. For no good reason, everyone in the Quantum Realm plays the pronoun game by avoiding Kang's name because he's a, just the Black Voldemort, I guess. No one conveys information or communicates the simplest ideas unless they've stalled like a fighter jet on the ascent. Then there are the world building problems. First off, the Quantum Realm, which was practically inescapable and greatly feared, is now effectively an amusement park. Why? Well, now Hank just has access to the Quantum Realm via the beacon, so it wouldn't surprise me if an army to fight against future versions of Kang is deus ex machina from the Quantum Realm to join the battle. And speaking of Quantum Realm, why is Janet so scared of being there when she sent Scott a few years ago without a care in the world? You remember that? The whole reason he avoids the blip in the first place, looking for quantum energy? And speaking of that, did everyone just forget that Janet can produce quantum energy too? These things are 
are never addressed and therefore go unanswered. And once again, we hear only a peep about the blip and nothing more. Cassie was arrested for trying to help homeless people. I can think of a hundred more pressing matters than that. Instead, she joined a fiery but mostly peaceful protest against police. You didn't think to join politics to help quell tensions in your town, county, or state? The blip wiped out half of all people in the universe. Why is there no conversation around the power vacuum that would be politics? How about the absence of law enforcement or medical staff? How about being a trauma therapist for all the people who blinked back into existence and discovered that family members were dead, that friends committed suicide, or everything they owned was sold, stolen, or confiscated? Just follow me on this thought experiment real fast. Imagine you poof back into your home, and there's a foul stench, and you follow that stench into a back room, and there, at the foot of your bed, you find a dead and rotting family pet. And it's there because you were ripped out of your own life. I lost both my cats. Oh yeah, that's right. All that world building was summed up as a stupid fucking joke in the beginning of Doctor Strange 2. Nope, can't waste our time thinking about that. Marvel is going to skip past all that brain power mumbo jumbo and go right back to having a guy in a suit punch another guy in a suit. And both lastly and hilariously, we have Kang the Conqueror. You know, Thanos received multiple reminders before the fantastic opening to Infinity War bent over everyone's reservations, including mine like a breeding bull. However, Kang was introduced in Loki, touted by Marvel as the next great villain, had next to no real buildup, most people have no idea who he is, and he loses to Ant-Man and Wasp in a fist fight. Are you kidding me? This dude without his technology or army is lower on the totem pole than Hawkeye? And with his technology and battle suit, he's weaker than an army of ants, and you expect me to believe he's a threat to the fucking Super Saiyan over here? Fuck off with this nonsense. Kang's impenetrable fortress was overrun by Ant-Man, Wasp, Cassie, Freedom Fighters, and ants like Starship Troopers, and I'm supposed to believe he's a threat. And I get it, he's a serious threat in the comics. But this isn't the comics. The MCU is a rudimentary version of the stories that occur in those pages, and when I go to see a movie that acts as the proper outing of the next major villain, I would like to see him be the threat he's been hyped to be. As far as I'm concerned, right now, Kang is on the same level of threat as Bowser. How am I supposed to take Kang seriously after this? He has genius intelligence, some will say. He has a lazy boy that travels through time and space but never thought to build a Dyson Sphere around the expanded energy core and harness that to power his IKEA catalog. I'm an idiot and thought of something this so-called genius from the 31st century couldn't. Or, since he was there way longer than Janet, maybe he or someone else can just produce quantum energy and he can exploit them. I mean, really, has anyone else realized that Kang is just a less threatening Rick? Also, just another goofy observation, but is this the measurement by which we judge the threats in the MCU? Thanos had an armchair, but Kang is higher up on the threat level because he has a nuclear-powered sofa. But what the fuck is next, Galactus on a king size while the Silver Surfer rides around on an ottoman? So... Yeah, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Floppia has been a fucking disaster for Marvel, both financially and critically, and yet, they're gonna keep trucking on. Have you seen what is slated? I have no idea what half of these things are. But what the fuck is an Echo? Doesn't matter, I guess, because before we know it, the Guardians of the Dad Bod will be upon us. In the meantime, a two-hour trailer for Secret Wars that leads into a two-minute teaser for Loki Season 2 that basically ends where it began. If running in place and going nowhere was a sport, Marvel would be the Bruce Jenner of it. Now, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.